Well, it's not my problem. It's that. Uh, The reason I got regular slides is because they're so reliable. <laughs> yeah, I have a live microphone on me. You can't hear? All right. I will submit to you the gate is a marker of health and disease. Uh, for those of you who are physicians, you're familiar with the concept of a final common pathway. I would submit the gate is a final common pathway that reflects everything you can think of and quite a few things you can't. So let's begin. We're talking in general about management of walking issues in transverse myelitis. But well, we have to talk a little bit about walking and even standing first. Now, standing at ease requires very few muscles. When I'm standing here in the military at ease position, like so, uh, can you see that, up there, that uh, slide up there? They're the only things that are firing. Um, I'm not going to let you come put an EMG on me, so you'll have to take my word for it. The only things that are firing, except when I gesture like this, are my upper trapezius and my soleus muscles. So it's a very, very energy conservation, uh, uh, conservative uh, activity. So you can stand for a very long time. Why is that? Is there a pointer? Is there a pointer? Why is that? If, if you look at the force line there, represented first by the dot and then the vertical line, you will see that with the external markers on there, that the... Thank you very much. Uh, sorry? Okay. The external markers, this force line passes slightly in front, uh, I'm sorry, slightly behind the hip joint. That means when you're standing at ease, if there's no contracture, nothing wrong, no flexor spasms, you can lean on your check ligaments, uh, such as the iliofemoral ligament of Bigelow that you all memorized in anatomy. Then the line goes just slightly in front of the knee. So you can uh, lean on the posterior capsule and the cruciates. Then it, it goes, you can't see it here, but just in front of the ankle. So that's why I have to do a little bit of soleus muscles. Gastrocnemius doesn't need to be bothered unless there's a big disturbance. So walking normally, I mean, standing normally is a very energy efficient, very cheap, inexpensive thing to do. And this just shows you a little bit of the, the skeleton there. Now when you're standing, you think perfectly straight. The hip joint isn't really 180 degrees, but it's close enough that it doesn't cost you much to do that. Now, contractures and or spasticity spoil this. Uh, I know I have a mixed uh, group here uh, of uh, consumers and uh, professionals. I, I suspect that the consumers know about as much about spasticity and contractures as the professionals, if not more, but just a brief definition, just in case. Contractures are a relatively fixed soft tissue shortening that prevent full range of motion of a joint. So if we were to go back and see this person with a little bit of a hip flexion contracture, then she's going to have trouble getting her center of gravity behind the hip joint. I'll have something to say about spasticity in a moment. Now, this patient did not have transverse myelitis. He's a typical hemiplegic patient, but one who has been allowed to lie in bed with the head of the bed rolled up, maybe some nice pillows under the head, maybe a nice pillow under the knee, and this is as straight as he can get his hip. So uh, it's going to take either a cane uh, or very strong muscles which he doesn't have or he wouldn't have gotten in that position in the first place. Uh, 
Likewise, this woman also does not have uh, transverse myelitis, but it illustrates the point. Uh, she gets nowhere near full extension of the hip, so she's going to need extra energy or an external device in order to, uh, to stand up straight. And here she is with the thigh vertical, and now you see how far down the pelvis is tilted. And she's having to use these sticks in order to even stand. We haven't even spoken about walking yet. Now, uh, your normal activities uh, are going to maintain most of your range of motion. This is a normal subject who uh, is caught in the act of walking with this, this uh, limb back in full extension, and that's very, very close to 180 degrees. Now, that's great. You're not going to get contractures, I suppose, if you're walking, but that's not what we're talking about. So how do you prevent contractures? The most important thing shown by some elegant work of Dr. Stoloff in Seattle more than 30 years ago, the most important thing in order to prevent contractures is positioning. If the therapist comes in and ranges you uh, 30 minutes a day and the other 23 hours and 30 minutes, you're in the wrong position, 23 hours wins. So range of motion is important, but positioning is even more important. Uh, prone lying is a form of positioning, but you can see here with the external markers, even prone lying, you're not fully extended at the hip. It looks like it, it looks like a straight line here, but actually that motion is taken up in the lumbar spine. So, but prone lying will help along with external positioning devices. Now, this is a young uh, woman uh, with a, a form, not Duchenne, but a form of muscular dystrophy. And you can see here with the markers that she is contracted in at least 90 degrees of flexion. And the only way she can stand uh, is by holding on to Dr. Kotke here. Now, after weeks and weeks and weeks of prolonged static stretch and ultrasound to the uh, structures anterior to the hip, including those uh, check ligaments, she is able better to stand here, holding on to Dr. Stoloff. Uh, but it's still a problem for her. It's st she still needs it because uh, in order to get her center of gravity behind the hip joint, uh, it's also behind the knee joint, and that's going to tend to make the knee buckle. So although contractures can be treated, they're a lot better prevented than treated. Okay, on to walking. Walking is normally a very efficient activity. If I go at my self-selected walking speed, like this, I can go literally for hours, have done it. Last summer in France, walking through Burgundy, uh, stopping only at the very best uh, vintners <laughs> for a little sampling. I, you can't be in Burgundy without taking samples. You see, it's very efficient. Uh, it's about 25%, which is not bad for an internal combustion mach machine. Uh, how do we make it so efficient? There are a number of things, a number of things that are necessary. Normal motor control, musculoskeletal integrity, adequate strength, adequate flexibility of the joints, as we just mentioned, plus the ability to deliver oxygen to the tissues. Now, uh, there are a number of things called the determinants of gait. But uh, let me... Let me tell you, besides the six determinants of, date, of gait, some of which will illustrate, there are other factors. For example, a pendulum, when it swings like this freely, takes very little energy. Okay, it's winding down, and you give it a little bit more, and again it goes. So if, if I am allowed to choose my walking speed, I will choose a speed of the, something close to the natural pendulum frequency but my joints have to be flexible. Now, even if your joints are diseased, there's almost no friction in the joints. It's the other things that limit it, the spastic muscles or the contracted uh, capsule or muscles themselves. Now, let's, let's talk about this. Let's look here first at 
a way of assessing the energy consumption to gate. This lower figure here is, is normal. And this shows just what you would expect. There are no surprises here, but they're going to be surprised on the next slide. Here is our walking speed in meters per second. And here is the oxygen consumed per minute per kilogram of body weight, per minute. In other words, the rate of oxygen consumption. Not surprising, if we're looking at the rate of oxygen consumption, that the faster you walk, the more you consume. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit with this slide, a jump just a little ahead to orthotic management. Here is a hemiplegic man uh, who has no brace on. Okay, and that's the most, uh, for this series of measurements, that is the most energy costly thing. The hemiplegic man walking without any orthosis. Now, here he ha is walking with two different orthoses. They look very, very different. One is a metal brace, metal double uprights, you've all seen, and the other is a rigid plastic brace. So not the more modern, more flexible ones, but a rigid plastic brace. They look entirely different, and yet biomechanically they are identical and cost the same amount of energy. Okay, so you, biomechanics, I'm going to come back to it over and over it again. Uh, you would think that if you have something heavy on your leg, it's going to cost you more energy to walk, right? But not necessarily. See, it costs less energy with those braces than without it. We'll come back to that when we talk about uh, uh, paraplegic walking. Now, no surprises in that last one, but here is something and they're known as the J-shaped walking curves. This is the normal again here. And this is the calories per meter walked per kilogram of body weight. Uh, it's efficiency, or actually the inverse of efficiency. Um, this is like miles per gallon with your car, but this is like gallons per mile with a tank. <laughs> okay, so this is the, the calories or the oxygen consumed per meter walked. And now you see something very interesting which is that there is an optimal amount, uh, an optimal speed where the energy consumed per meter is uh, the lowest, okay? And if you tell a person to walk at his comfortable walking speed, not trying to prove anything, just pick a walking speed that you think you could do all day, they automatically pick that out, even if they've never seen these curves. Now, here, uh, are some other things. These are persons, uh, this is a person with an amputation. And here he's walking with crutches. Very, very costly of energy and a very sharp nadir there. Only at that one speed does he have his lowest and it's still very high energy consumption. Um, here's a pylon, like a peg leg, Captain Hook. And here is a well-fitted artificial limb with a suction socket. It's right at the upper limits of normal. Okay, so remember, there is an optimal efficiency. Uh, but there are a number of priorities in gait. And efficiency isn't the very top one. Can you guess what the top priority is? Comfort, that's right. Avoidance of pain. You know, you can fake a limp, but you can't fake a no limp, okay? <laughs> if, if, if you hurt, sometimes we say to young people in sports medicine, well, he can go back to playing when he doesn't limp anymore. And the mother says, well, he can fake a limp. Yeah, but he can't fake a no limp. I, I've seen very proud people who do not want to limp, do not want to be seen limping, and they can't help it. So that's number one, is avoidance of pain. What's the second priority, usually? Safety. Yeah, you don't want to fall on your nose. Okay. And uh, although the following one will vary from individual to individual, I would say probably the third priority is not looking goofy. 
Okay, and then energy cost is probably fourth. Uh, there was a woman who uh, worked as a secretary for our prosthetic orthotic program in Seattle, and she had had uh, a badly set hip fracture as a young person and was allowed to be in the wrong position. Uh, position. So she got an adduction contracture, okay? And so she would walk in the least goofy way, but it was pretty energy costly. Uh, her, she was like so, and so she would walk like this, okay? Because that's not too goofy. But when she'd go to the copy machine, she'd stand like this, you know, so that her pelvis could be level, okay? Now, she could have walked with her pelvis level, but that, that looks pretty goofy, okay? So... Uh, nobody's going to do that. Besides that, it's incredibly energy costly. So we have a number of priorities in GATE. We'll talk about them. Um, but why is it that we can walk so, so efficiently normally? Uh, a long time ago, back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, work was done by uh, some orthopedists called Saunders and Inman. And this is one of the classic articles on gait, or Dr. Lehman would call it one of the antique articles. But it's, it's an oldie but a goodie on the six determinants of normal gait. Now, if you imagine that you had, uh, say, just a bar for a pelvis and just flexion and extension at the hips and, uh, when necessary, a little bit of lateral movement, but ordinarily all you could do when walking forward was flex and extend your hip. Nothing at the knee, uh, nothing at the foot or ankle. So you had a, two pylons here and two hinges. Then what would happen, and I may never recover, but I'll give it a try. Uh, you step down into a hole. See, I have to cheat a little bit and I bent that left one. Then I have to step out of that hole. And it would make a series of arcs at least three inches. Uh, if we didn't have the first five determinants. And the sixth determinant is the angle, uh, a physiologic knock knee. Uh, women tend to be a little bit knock kneed. Men are more likely to be bow legged. Or as Tennessee Ernie Ford said, that he saw a couple going down the street. He was so bow legged and she was so knock kneed that then when they walked together, they spelled ox. Okay. <laughs> but there is this tibial femoral angle. And uh, I hope you don't mind. I hear you've been lectured to all day long, so I thought maybe a little change of pace would be okay. Uh, the tibial femoral angle, if it weren't for that, if we were straight down, then I have to get my center of gravity under me somehow, so there's going to be a lot of lateral movement. Okay? Even if you're very, very strong, you can't stand with your center of gravity outside your base of support. Even the strongest man in Ireland cannot stand outside his base of support. Okay, so we have this series of determinants. One of them is knee flexion. So, uh, actually we're showing two on this one. This is a two for one. If you notice, right after heel strike, at heel strike, the knee is straight, unless you're running. If you're just walking, Ordinarily, the knee is straight at heel strike, but immediately it goes into some flexion, anywhere from 12 to 15 degrees of knee flexion by mid stance of gait. Now that keeps that center of gravity pathway from going up quite so, so fast, or so far rather. In addition, down here at the foot and ankle, you're allowing the, the foot to uh, go into plantar flexion and that keeps you from jerking the knee forward like that. And then as you go over it, once again, you, you plantar flex actively with a shortening contraction, and that keeps the limb fairly long. So uh, the, the nice thing about this foot-ankle movement is that, remember, when you are changing direction, you go like so, if you go up again fast, remember uh, this movement up and down, that's directional, and that costs you energy. It's, it's like coming up to a stop sign, 
deciding you're going to back up, and then going forward again. So direction changes cost you energy. Pelvic rotation. Now, you are interested in transverse myelitis, but some of you here are also interested in Parkinson's disease. And I will tell you uh, my notion that the first thing to go in Parkinson's disease is not the arm swing, which is what you're always taught. It's the rotations. So watch me walk as myself, okay? And there are rotations, pelvis, thigh, uh, tibia, okay? Watch me walk as my Seattle friend with Parkinson's watches. Okay? It's like a board, straight. So these rotations enable you to take a longer step without the center of gravity going so far down. This all happens automatically unless there's something getting in the way, uh, such as weakness or spasticity. Um, I can tell you can't possibly see that from the... Oh! Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Aim to please. Oh, that's bringing, that isn't focusing it. I did that. I thought you did that. Okay. Okay. Well, now that we've got it close enough, could we focus it? Well, it doesn't matter. That's okay. I know what they are, and I'll tell them to you. All right. I will. I will tell you some of what the the uh, muscles do, and then uh, I will do some of these abnormal gaits with focal weakness. Now, some with transverse myelitis will have like a paraplegia, and we will discuss orthotic management of that. Actually, we're doing okay, I guess, for time. We'll talk about orthotic management of that. But some of the focal weaknesses. Uh, I'll demonstrate the, uh, the gates myself. The pretibial group, the, the muscles here in the front of the leg. Remember, the anatomic leg is from the knee down. And so if I'm talking about the whole limb, I'll speak of the lower limb. Or just this part, I'll speak of the thigh. Um, I almost missed that question in anatomy once, was asked to draw a cross-section. So uh, I learned that the almost hard way what the leg is from there to there. Okay, so the pretibial group. Now, uh, they are not doing very much in swing phase, just a little bit. Okay, it just takes a little bit of force normally, unless you have spasticity in the antagonistic muscles, just a little bit of force to clear that foot. But look, look at this activity right after heel strike here. Big peak of activity. That is one of those foot ankle mechanisms I mentioned, allowing the foot to come down smoothly. Um, let's see if I can make some noise up here. Okay, a mild to moderate weakness of those muscles you can diagnose with your ears, especially if it's a hard floor, and especially if you can find a ramp and have them walk down it. But let's, let's see if I can do this. Okay, that slap... Uh, I'm feigning a weakness of my right ones. Okay, try it again. You hear that slap? Okay, so a mild to moderate weakness you can diagnose with your ears. If it's a severe weakness, it doesn't slap louder. If it's a severe weakness, you can't pick up the toe at all. And so you'll have a steppage gait. Now let me tell you the priorities when it comes to energy cost. Okay, you will do the cheapest thing you can. Okay, automatically. So if you can bend your hip and knee extra, you will clear by what we call a steppage gait. All right, that's the cheapest. Now, if you can't bend your knee, then you'll do the next cheapest thing, which is to circumduct, okay, uh, to clear that leg and swim f in swing phase. If that's not enough, now we're, we're talking real money here, a uh, real energy costs, now you have to hike your hip, okay, and you'll probably swing it out as well. 
And if that's not enough, then you will add vaulting on the other side. Okay? So the first, I only had to lift the limb a little bit. Now I have to swing it out. Now I have to lift the whole hind quarter. Now I've got to lift my whole body weight. So that gets very costly. Um, I once saw a woman, those of you who know Seattle know it's a place of hills. Uh, I saw a woman walking up James Street toward Harborview. And uh, this was a woman of a certain size. So she was not slender. She was walking up this steep hill that they generally close even with a bad rain, let alone with, with snow. So a steep hill. Uh, she had almost certainly had had polio a number of years before. Up that steep hill, circumducting, hip hiking, and vaulting. And uh, this was the days before video cameras, or I might have been tempted to stop and offer her all the money in my purse to allow uh, me to make a teaching tape. I don't think she'd have liked that. But, you know, if the money's right, who knows? OK. <clears throat> uh, the calf group. Uh, let me uh, tell you or show you what would happen if the calf muscles are weak. Uh, speaking of money, uh, we had uh, some normal volunteers who, we, uh, who allowed us uh, for a modest, non-coercive sum to uh, do temporary blocks of their tibial nerve or their perineal nerve. Okay, and first we'd run them through the great gate lab and get their normal gait. Then we'd do the block, run them through again. And can you guess what happens with the calf muscle group being weak. You see it's kind of in late stance phase there. If the calf muscle group is weak, then you don't have push off. And here are our priorities again. You don't want to look goofy. You don't want to cost a lot of energy. So if you'll, if you'll watch my normal step length here, okay, and sort of memorize that. Now I have a weakness in my right gastrocnemius, and I'm going to try to take the normal step. Okay, I step into a hole, and I'm going to have to step out. Nobody's going to walk that way. It's very costly, energy costly, and you line up for Monty Python's Ministry of Silly Walks. Okay, uh, I should have brought that. Oh shoot. Okay, the the quad. Yeah, I'm funny enough. You just say the quad, the quadriceps group. Remember I said that right after heel strike, we go into 10, uh, 12 to 15 degrees of flexion of the knee. I can't stand on a flexed knee without quadriceps. So what am I going to do? If I have a complete weakness of the quadriceps, I'm going to avoid heel strike because that tends to make my knee buckle. I'm going to come down with a foot flat, and then I'm going to keep that knee locked in extension throughout the whole time, okay? That isn't going to show much on the level ground, particularly if a person has good sensation, has been doing it a long time, but it's going to be heck to pay on ramps. Stairs are not so bad if you lead up with a strong leg and lead down with a weak leg, but ramps are going to be the way to bring this out, okay? We, we don't really have to do a whole course in kinesiology, but this, this gives you some idea. And I do want to talk about a couple of hip muscles here, uh, the abductor group, the gluteus medius, and the gluteus maximus. How did we stand? How did we stand in extending our hips? Just alignment stabilized, OK? so. When you walk, though, you've got to be able to stabilize in a dynamic fashion. So if your hip muscles, the gluteus maximus, is weak, you're going to get that center of gravity way behind the hip joint. Okay, So that's a backward lurch from just a right-sided uh, gluteus maximus weakness. And on my way back, I'll do a hip abductor weakness. In order to stand, some of you do a, part of your neurologic exam, a Trendelenburg test. Okay, and if there's just a little bit of weakness of the gluteus medius, then 
you see my belt here, it drops down more than normal, okay? But if it's really, really weak, then I'm going to throw it over. So as I, as I walk, okay, I may also do that if I have pain in this hip, okay? Um, which is also my little uh, plug for actually examining patients because I've had people sent to me with, quote, back troubles, and lo and behold, if you examine them, the problem is in the hip, and they get the hip replaced, and they're happy campers, so forth. Now, spasticity treatment is a whole uh, lecture in and of itself. But suffice it to say that in addition to the pharmacological, the drugs, uh, the blocks, the baclofen pump, there are physiological things that can be done, and physical therapists can show you how. Uh, for example, when you have an incomplete spinal cord injury uh, or spinal cord dysfunction from whatever cause, particularly at the higher levels, often what will happen is that the two joint muscles, particularly the extensors and the lower limbs, are the offenders. And so, for example, the rectus femoris. Now, uh, you will see persons with an incomplete spinal cord injury walking as though they're walking on posts, okay? Because how do, how do I flex my knee normally? This is one that medical students always miss. They'll say, well, I use my hamstrings. Well, that's how you do it when you stand there. That's not how you do it when you walk. When you walk, you accelerate the thigh, and just inertia causes the shank, the leg, to hang behind, and that flexes the knee. Easy as pie. Same way as an above-the-knee amputee wearing a prosthesis will, will flex his knee. But now this rectus femoris is firing too much, and it won't let you do it. So now I can't clear it. Oh, that leg's too long. So I'm going to have to circumduct do something, and if it's bilateral, that's a Dickens of a gait. So uh, one of the problems that we sometimes see is that the spasticity is focal. There's certain offenders that are causing a lot of trouble, and by the time you would raise the dosage of the medication high enough to, uh, to help the spasticity, the patient would be asleep or otherwise toxic. So uh, certain blocks, uh, either botulinum toxin or if you, if you have the equipment and the skill, uh, phenol blocks just to the rectus femoris and you leave the rest of the quadriceps intact. With a few exceptions, the offenders tend to be the two joint muscles, which is nice because they are in general more superficial. So if you don't want to do the block, you can put an ice pack on the rectus femoris 20 minutes, long enough to cool the spindles, and you'll get up to 90 minutes of relief. You say, what good is 90 minutes of relief? Well, you can do a lot of ambulation training and stretching in those 90 minutes. Um, and uh, besides that, that's something the patient can do at home, and he's taught to. It doesn't need special stuff, just a refrigerator. And uh, put those ice packs on. Okay, you say, well, what good is that if you have to do it every day? That's like saying, well, you know, I just took a shower this morning and probably going to have to take another one tomorrow. This soap's no good. Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, there are things that you can do. And prolonged stretch is very, very good, particularly with com when combined with ice. Now, suppose one has a paralysis, say, from the waist down. Uh, a little bit about orthotic management. Now, here's a person walking with a swing through gait. Can we just shift that so that we can see the other? Uh, we don't need the writing. Actually, I know what it says. So we could cut off the writing. There we go. And have, um, here's a person using a, uh, a swing through gait. And on the far right, a swing to gate. And we're looking at the base of support. As again, even the strongest man in Ireland cannot stand outside his base of support. Um, here are the shoes, the feet, and the two crutches, and the center of mass, or the center of pressure in this case, well 
inside that trapezoid. Okay? Likewise, when he has swung through, uh, it's well inside that base of support. But he's only swinging two. He's got pretty good side to side stability, but he's pretty precarious here. Now, I, as I've said, uh, we're imagining a person who has no strength in the muscles below the waist. So if you imagine, right now he's got his center of mass behind the hip joint, but he's moving and he has to really allow that, the pelvis uh, to come forward and the trunk to go back. Imagine now he has a 20 degree hip flexion contracture. Okay, what's going to happen? Collapse like a jackknife. Okay, so we have to prevent those contractures. You always have to think uh, that someone is going to want to walk. Maybe they won't. Maybe they're going to say, it's, it's, well, I might do it for an exercise. I'm not going to use it to get around. But we don't know that when the, the disorder first comes on. So we, we always want to look uh, for the best outcome. Okay, some braces, some configurations of of uh, double metal upright braces that we studied these again in our lab at the University of Washington. And if you're going to go double metal upright, the one on the far left is the best. They all weigh more or less the same. Uh, all of these have uh, the proper kind of ankle, which I'll describe in a moment. But the uh, least pressure on the skin comes from this configuration. Uh, where the distal closure, not necessarily distal thigh bend, you don't have to put the distal thigh bend that far distal, but the closure is just above the kneecap and inferiorly uh, the uh, patellar tendon strap. So that's, that's the kind that puts, takes the least total force to keep the knee from buckling uh, and uh, the least pressure per square inch. Why do we care about that? We also showed that if you have even a 10 degree flexion contracture in that knee, the forces required to keep the knee in extension are enormous. And the skin may not be tolerant of it. Now the ankle. Uh, here's another example of how the least weight may not be the cheapest to walk with. Okay, here, here is a brace with just a posterior stop that gives the foot some pickup so the toe doesn't drag. But it does not resist dorsiflexion, so it doesn't mimic the gastrocnemius. Remember I told you how if I had a gastrocnemius paralysis and tried to take a normal step? There I am, down there. So now I get down there, now it's going to cost me to get out. I have to lift that whole center... I have to lift the whole body weight out. So even though this, this brace, which allows free dorsiflexion, allows this angle to become acute, has a little less weight than the kind I will show you, it actually costs more to walk with, and I'll show you an example of that. Now, this one does have an anterior stop, but the sole plate in the shoe is so flexible that the anterior stop can't do much good. And we have from time to time uh, actually x-rayed the shoe to, to see if it was transparent. It should not be transparent to x-ray. And here you have a good rigid sole plate, uh, an extra little buttress there, and now you see that the person can pivot around his metatarsal heads without this angle collapsing. Therefore, he can take the normal step length uh, without having to lift so much uh, body weight. Now, here, here are some pulse rate curves. Here, here's the pulse rate curve with a heavier brace, but has a biomechanical advantage. It, doesn't, it allows you to pivot around the, the uh, metatarsal heads. This is a man with paraplegia walking uh, with bilateral uh, braces, long leg braces, now called knee, ankle, foot orthoses, and crutches, and a swing through gait. Okay, here is the lighter brace, but it doesn't have the anterior stop. 
And so even though the brace is lighter, it doesn't have that biomechanical advantage and costs more in terms of heart rate. And uh, we have some other figures, which I didn't include, that show even in the minutes of rest, they're still consuming more oxygen after walking with the lighter brace that doesn't have the biomechanical advantage. And the reason for this has to do, these are five persons with paraplegia, uh, the amount of lift. Uh, it's hard for you to read, so I'll show you the figures. Okay, here, here is the anterior and posterior stop so that the patient can rock around his metatarsal heads. And you see here that the center of gravity never falls. The marker is on the greater trochanter, which is the best visible uh, measure of the center of gravity. The greater trochanter never falls down very far and he only has to lift it up a little bit and it's a smooth lift. Watch now. Here's the other brace and he fall, the ankle collapses, he falls way down here and has to suddenly turn it around and make a jackrabbit start and lift the whole center, of, uh, lift the whole body weight sharply upward and that's why it costs so much energy. So it's not just the brace and how much it weighs, it, it's what it does and the biomechanical advantage. Standing. The person with the, uh, just the posterior stop, so no resistance to dorsiflexion, these are seconds. This one stands uh, one, one and a half seconds, three and a half seconds, 3.6 before he has to catch himself with the crutches. One and a half seconds. This one's pretty good. But he had a lower lesion. 40 seconds. We, we capped them off because we didn't want to stand there all day. With a double stop, we capped them off at 300 seconds. Okay, they, they could stand there all day. Um, 300, 300, 246. This one, just nine seconds, but he could only stand one and a half the other and double this one. Uh, so it's the biomechanical advantage. Um, quickly, because we're about out of time. This is something more often used for children, known as the para walker. It's got something holding the the uh, buttocks and the hips, therefore an extension and a little chest plate up here. Uh, the reciprocating gait orthosis. There's another little extension up here, uh, which which looks good on paper. The only trouble with the reciprocating gait orthosis, uh, the idea of it is that. When you flex this hip, it's going to extend that one. If you've got the, the strength uh, in your hip flexors to do that, then you can alignment stabilize your hip if you don't have any contractures. You don't need all of this extra stuff, which is very difficult to get on and off. Uh, so it's, it's a nice idea. Uh, we've never really seen it work very satisfactorily. Um, Electrical stimulation. Now, uh, things are constantly improving, so what's shown in this study may not be true uh, today or even or tomorrow, especially. Here is, is the uh, speed of walking uh, in the early part of these, uh, these uh, energy efficiency curves. Now, this is per meter walked, remember, not a rate, but how much it costs to walk a meter. Here's the normal down here in the slower speeds. Here are these simple long leg braces, not that far from normal. And here was with the, the functional electrical stimulation. So at least in that particular study, uh, it cost more with the electrical stimulation. Things will, will improve, but uh, there are other reasons for doing electrical stimulation than efficiency of walking. Efficiency isn't the only goal. You would like to keep the muscles in condition. But for efficiency, at least with that study, uh, it isn't so good as simple long leg braces. And I, um, I think I'm going to stop there uh, and ask for any questions. Any I could, questions for Dr. Dealer? I could do the effects of heels. <laughs> I brought some along. Do, do, can you guess what the effect would be of heels? Oh, okay. Shorter step and bent knees. Oh, 
Oh, that's a that's a really that's a complicated question. I'll I'll be happy. Yeah, it had to do would would I put a person with quadriplegia, not that's paraplegia, in a system? <laughs> okay. Uh, there there are things besides walking, and whatever I say today is probably going to be different tomorrow, and. Uh, it, it may be that that treadmill uh, imposed walking uh, may be more efficient with a person with a higher lesion, lesion. Obviously, suspended treadmill. You're not going to put them on and let them collapse. But uh, it, it may be that some of these externally imposed, you think, Kelly, uh, may be more value than the sequential stimulation. Although that has some value for different reasons to, to help promote the circulation and, uh, and keep the muscles in good condition with respect to their ability to develop tension and consume oxygen. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. My problem is that I have a knee that backwards. Yes. And I assume he, is, he said his problem is that he has a knee that bends backwards. I, I assume from residuals of transverse myelitis, or not necessarily. I that way, and my mother always told me that I uh, cut it out, and actually sound like a pregnant woman. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I could throw my leg back pretty much like this, and consequently I'm paying for it now because uh, my left leg, unless I wear a brace, and uh, I hate the thing, uh, does flex back. But no neurologic problem? Nothing else wrong? Not, not that I know of. Well, I'll be happy to see you afterwards. Uh, I'll be, uh, yeah, there, there usually is some reason, because uh, there are lots of us folks that when we don't have to do anything, stand with a knee hyperextended. There's uh, uh, something known as the crossed extension reflex, um, and uh, I might not look like it, but I'm a Seattle Mountaineer. And there's something known as the rest step that makes use of the crossed extension reflex. So when you're going up really steep areas, you put your foot up on the next, I've got to balance here, next step, and you see the flexion here, the stretching of the extensors here, spreads extension to the opposite side. And so I, I lean on that. Uh, you will also have seen pictures of Bantu that lean with their, their spears. They stand like that for hours. And flamingos <laughs> can do it too. Yeah. Okay, we've had a really long day. Why don't you stay and we can ask questions individually, but people have been here for a long time. So tomorrow we start at breakfast at 7.45, and then first talks are at 8.15, and we're going to try to do a round table discussion, kind of like what we had today. Sometime tomorrow, I'm not exactly sure when, but we'll make sure that happens. Any other announcements? Oh, um, if you're interested in bidding on the, on the auction things,